Hello and welcome to the session on women's sport. Um, we have three speakers, two in the room and one who is going to join us um, over Zoom um, from Hotter Climbs and who has got up early in order to do this. So welcome Lucy, we will see you um, as the middle person of three. Um, we have a variety of people, to, uh, a variety of sports that we're going to um, be thinking about today. Um, our first athletes may not be considered athletes by some of you, but Sarah Needham Beck from Chichester is going to persuade us in no uncertain terms that ballet dancers are indeed athletes. Um, we then have Lucy um, on your go go. Oh, sorry, Lucy, I've not got my piece of paper with your last name on it, so please tell us what it is when um, on your. I think that you can correct me um, when when you appear. Thank you. Um, and Lucy is going to be talking to you about her experiences of being selected for the British bobsleigh team. And finally, we will have Naomi also, Naomi Datsun, also from the University of Chichester, who is going to talk about some of her research in women's football. Um, we have. Uh, we're, the running order actually is going to be slightly different from that. We're going to start with Sarah, then Lucy, and then Naomi. Um, the, uh, welcome to all of those of you in the room, um, as well as to our speakers, and to those of you who are watching remotely. Um, questions will be taken at the end of the three talks, so more as a panel discussion, with... Um, opportunities for those of you who are watching um, remotely to contribute to those questions and to the panel discussion by using the chat box facility that you will see on um, the medium that you're, you're watching through. So that would be really great. Um, so without further ado, I shall pass over to Sarah to convince us about ballet dancers. Thanks, Bev, and uh, thanks everyone for coming along to hear this presentation. So, yeah, I am hopefully going to um, be providing uh, what I hope is an interesting uh, problem that maybe could be helped through collection of data and analysis techniques. Um, so, the particular topic I'm going to be talking about today is monitoring training and performance demands in dance. Um, as Bev said, not necessarily a sort of go-to when you think of sport, uh, but I'll be presenting lots of data that, that we've collected so far that shows just how demanding physically and also psychologically, but I'll be focusing on the physical today, uh, just how demanding the training and performance schedule of dancers is. So let me see if hopefully this will work. Yes. So um, I'm going to sort of mainly go through today what I'm going to refer to as the problem, um, and that relates in this sort of wheel on the side here to, to current practice. So what is currently done within professional um, and pre-professional dance. Um, current research efforts in collecting data and how that could maybe help to solve this problem. Uh, and then the future directions really sits on this uh, analysis and then applications for how we could then perhaps put a few interventions or suggestions, recommendations in to inform the practice and start this cycle all over again. So the, the problem generally, uh, to put this whole presentation in one sentence, is that dancers dance a lot, is basically what I'm going to be focusing on today. So across all levels of dance training and performance in different styles, in different countries, um, there's a really high volume of work with limited rest time. And this has problems um, with things like overtraining, fatigue, burnout, and injury rates are very high in dance. Uh, they also tend to have quite short careers. So in terms of the health and well-being and performance of these dancers, um, the current training practices aren't necessarily optimised um, to allow all of that. Uh, just to, to start to, to illustrate this, I've just pulled out a couple of examples here from studies. So um, students on a university dance programme, so those doing academic study but also training for maybe a future career in dance, um, were documented as spending up to 21 hours a week in class, so just, that's just technique class where they're just kind of honing their skills, honing their craft. Um, and then with an extra three to six hours on top of that uh, towards the end of a semester when they're getting ready for uh, end of term 
performances, uh, practical exams, things like that. So a lot of physical training on top of uh, an academic load for those training dancers at university level. And then uh, another example study here from 2010 uh, where they had accelerometers um, on professional ballet dancers throughout the day. Um, and they found that 90% of the sample had less than 60 minutes rest uh, at any given time across a training day, with a third of them having less than 20 minutes rest at a given time. So what, what does a day in the life of a professional ballet dancer look like practically? Just to delve into this a little bit further before I show you some of the data that's been collected around this. Um, essentially, it's, it's about a 12-hour day, around six days a week. So this is an example from the Royal Ballet, who are a, a residential ballet company um, based at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. And they will be performing multiple ballets throughout an 11-month season, with those often overlapping. And the way that it's structured as well means that dancers rotate into different roles within those ballets. So a single dancer might be rehearsing up to three to five ballets at a time and up to about nine different roles within that one ballet. And what that leads to is uh, this very large chunk of every day just in rehearsal. So forget the performance that happens right at the end of the day, uh, which is the main event. They've spent sort of a good six hours or so prior to that rehearsing for things that are coming up. Uh, in the schedule, so there's a lot of overlapping in the schedule, which does create this busy, busy working day. Um, they do get a month off in August, uh, so the Royal Ballet don't perform in Covent Garden in August, but the top dancers will then often go off and guest uh, perform at other companies around the world. Um, so there's not really this kind of off-season that you would see in sports either. They do get some support. What's good is uh, the Royal Ballet in particular, they do have um, a really good healthcare team. So you can see there is a, a physio appointment snuck in here uh, throughout the day as well, which is, which is a recent thing um, in dance. There, there typically isn't that same support system as you would see uh, with elite athletes in place, but we're getting there. I often say that with the dance support, we're sort of about 20 years behind sports science, but we're getting there in terms of starting to look at the dancers and their physical uh, demands and how we can help them. So that's, that's your sort of typical day um, at the Royal Ballet. And as I mentioned, they do have a, a healthcare team who are based there now and have been for the last sort of six, seven years. Um, and so they have been also collecting data to, to back this up and to start to uh, put some sort of boundaries on this, this problem of, of limited rest time. Um, and they're starting to put that out there now, which is, is very helpful for the rest of us trying to work in dance uh, to have this big data set to look at. So this is a, a preprint of a paper that, that's coming out soon from the, the team based at the Royal Ballet. Um, and this is uh, across five seasons worth of data of um, those dancers. And you can see we've got weekly dance hours uh, sitting with, with huge variation between the different ranks within the company. So just to explain that quickly, uh, down the bottom here, you've got the principles of the lead dancers who will typically do slightly less because they're in focused roles, but they're the stars of the show. And then as we sort of move up here uh, into the artists and the apprentices, those are the sort of chorus, the, the, the bass uh, dancers who will be uh, on stage in, in those roles. Think of the swans in Swan Lake. Um, so you can see that they, in terms of performance, performances across the season, they're doing a lot more um, than the dancers down this end, although arguably these roles are the more demanding roles physically. So you have this balance. But you can see, again, with the big variation, but you can see um, at the top end here up to around 100, 125 performances a season. We think a, a footballer, Naomi can correct me if I'm wrong here, would typically have sort of 40 to 50 matches over the course of a season. Um, so not just long training hours, but a lot of output, a lot of uh, performance expected as well. And this is then another study just to show that this is not just uh, the Royal Ballet. So um, this is uh, a study where they had dancers wearing accelerometers. So this isn't the five-year analysis daily tracking that they're doing at the Royal Ballet. Uh, this is over a shorter kind of period of, of monitoring. Um, but the companies used in this study were the Birmingham Royal Ballet and the English National Ballet. So again, UK-based prestigious companies, but they tour work rather than having a residential um, home. Uh, but again, uh, we've got the different ranks here within the company, um, and 
very high hours. So this is, this is in minutes, so I'll put it into hours to make it make a bit more sense. Um, so here they, they classified working day physical activity. So that was between uh, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. And everyone was basically physically active for that entire time, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, and then they also found this extra physical activity. So this is outside of those working day hours. And you can see that, that they're working even more. So what they found in this study was an extra around nine hours per day of physical activity outside of the typical working day. So that they're, they're active in some way. Some will be high intensity, some will be low intensity, but they're physically active for about 17 hours of the day and then sleeping for about six hours. So basically when they're awake, uh, they're active. So that, that data from ballet gives us a little bit of an idea about the durations. Um, but when we look at things like training load and the overall demands, we're also interested in the intensity of that work, as I just mentioned. Um, so studies in training load look at the duration of activity, but also the intensity. So often measured just in arbitrary units as duration times by a uh, perceived intensity. Uh, so a couple of studies in dance here, uh, not on the same sort of scale as, as the previous studies, um, looking at pre-professional. So we're now looking at school and sort of adolescent training dancers and reporting weekly training loads of around 4,000, again, with, with big variation around those numbers depending on the individual. And similar studies have been done a lot more in sport, and they've gotten to a point where they are starting to model what is too much, so they can start to set thresholds in terms of at what point does the fatigue start setting, at what point are we increasing injury risk. So in rugby union, um, they've highlighted a weekly cumulative load of over 1,200 as being uh, related to injury risk. So we have much higher numbers here. However, obviously, the, the training modality and the nature of injury very different in ballet uh, versus rugby. Um, but it does highlight that it might, this is maybe where we need to get to in dance, where we can start to look at how much is too much and at what point do we need to start to modify the schedule. Um, so that's sort of where we're, where we're aiming for, really, with this kind of training load work, where we can set a threshold where we say, you know, maybe around 2,500 or 3,000, especially for young dancers in training, uh, might be more appropriate. So we, we collected some dancers on our students um, training on our dance performance program at the University of Chichester. Um, this was over a 10-week period, uh, and we just tracked their daily, daily training loads, so duration of activity times by intensity. And uh, we found an even higher weekly training load, so around 5,000. Um, and there's some interesting patterns that you can see here. So the, the load tended to be highest on a Monday and then sort of decreased throughout the week. You see they're not doing as much on the weekend, but they're still not completely resting over the weekend. Come back on the Monday, nice and high. This was a, a half-term week here, and then this was a, an assessment and performance at the end of term. So they sort of came straight from not doing a lot or not too much over the holidays straight back into this high uh, workload as they came back in, which is not going to be great. <laughs> Generally, as the research shows in sport, you want to avoid these big kind of spikes where we go from a low load to a high load. So this is something else for us to potentially look at, even within our own scheduling of our university dance program. So just to, to, to switch tack then, I don't have a link slide between these two things. Um, another project that I'm involved in at the minute is that um, a team of us at Chichester are currently working with Riverdance on their 25th anniversary tour, which has just um, recommenced after being halted from COVID. Um, so they started back out on tour at the end of August. Um, and I put this example up because we're, we're working with them to look at the physical demands of their tour, basically. And even just from looking at the schedule, hopefully most of you think, wow, that's, that's pretty busy. There's not a lot of rest time in there. But this is the demand for the show. You know, Riverdance is still a hugely popular show. Uh, so these are the expectations of the dancers in terms of dates to meet within that tour. Uh, so as a summary, this is a 17-week tour, um, which they've just started after not dancing and performing for a couple of years, uh, which is another interesting aspect. Uh, 27 different venues across the UK, 114 shows, and an average of around seven shows a week with traveling in between that. Um, lots, of show, uh, lots of days are two show days, so they have a matinee and an evening 
performance on those days. Sometimes then, sort of down here, getting straight on the coach after performing two shows uh, to go to a different venue and then perform again the next day. So this isn't just across ballet. Um, this kind of schedule is very common if you think about uh, theatre-type dance. If you think about the West End, they'll be performing eight shows a week throughout the entire year. And not only are they performing it very often, but the show itself is quite demanding as well. So just to show you, um, this is just a heart rate trace uh, from one of the female dancers from a two-show day so from Riverdance. So the blue line here is uh, the matinee show where she was performing the lead role in the show. Uh, and then rather than, than having the evening off after she perf wasn't performing the lead, she then rotated into just a normal troupe role um, in the evening show, which is shown in red. And you can see that the, that the lead role is more physically demanding uh, than the troupe role. There's a kind of clear gap uh, here, even in the, the resting moments. And these are the different numbers in the show here. Um, so you can see the kind of the pattern of the demands of the show. Basically, they're off stage, sort of keeping warm. Then they're on stage, and the, the demand goes up pretty rapidly. Uh, stays at a high demand for the two, three minutes for the duration of that number and then comes back down, and they're sort of keeping themselves warm until they're on again for the next number. And across the data we've collected so far, this is, this is an ongoing study. We started it just before uh, the pandemic when they were on tour, and we just resumed this work with the company again. Um, so we're collecting more of this data all the time to describe these demands and how they change throughout that tour. Um, but majority of the dancers are working pretty maximally for the times where they're on the stage. So any, from sort of 75 up to 100% um, of their individual maximum. Uh, Riverdance do, the company, do actually have something in place to try and manage this, uh, which is very sort of good practice within dance, so not a lot of dance companies do have that at the moment. Um, I say it's something we're trying to push more towards in the industry. Um, so the way that they try to manage this is that every number in the show, so this is an example from the female troupe numbers here, so these are different numbers within the show, and they all have sort of a point system uh, assigned to them. So it's pretty simple. It's either a 0, a 0.5, a 1, or a 1.5. Um, but that allows them to identify, this is just purely based on their perception at the moment, allows them to identify the most demanding numbers um, so that they can rotate dancers in and out of those numbers to give them lighter and heavier shows, particu particularly for those dancers that are rotating into the lead. So they are trying um, to manage the schedule as much as they can within the, within the parameters of the tour. Um, so this is something else that, that we're looking at as well with the data we're collecting with them, is we're trying to basically assess if, if this is accurately representing the demand at the moment. Um, and then using the data that we've collected to see if we can modify this system, maybe make it a bit more complex, um, to try and improve the effectiveness of this practice so that it is actually helping to, to manage the load on the dancers and allow them to perform that whole tour without getting injured uh, or the performance dropping off, which the audiences definitely don't want, and neither do the dancers. So th that sort of uh, whistle-stop tour through what, what we know so far in dance. I say we're very much at the early stages of giving this support to, to dancers. Um, so the previous and current research is, is starting to build a picture of what the demands are and the current practice that is happening across different dance styles. And then the next stage is really are to start looking into analysis and how can we look at this data to, to figure out ways that we can apply and make recommendations to improve practice. So modeling of crunch points, particularly within uh, that Riverdance touring schedule, what are, are there particular points at which uh, a sort of breaking point is, is happening on that tour where they would need maybe a week off uh, within that? Um, are there peaks and dips in performance that we can identify? Where is fatigue happening? Where are injuries happening? And as I mentioned earlier, can we set some kind of thresholds and parameters to, to guard against that? And then using the data uh, to suggest changes to practice where feasible. See, there is a big where feasible within this. We can't sort of say, yep, you need to cut half of your tour dates. That has far-reaching implications. Um, mainly for scheduling, as I've talked about today, but also things uh, like for me as a physiologist, preparing the dancers better for that performance. If that's the load that they're going to have to meet, then 
Have we made best use of the rehearsal periods leading up to that to prepare them for that? Is their individual fitness at a level where they can sustain uh, that demand over that period of time? And then other things we can implement as well to help them recover better. If, if that schedule isn't able to change, then what can we do in those other moments to help support their recovery? So those are all places that we, that we want to take this research uh, as we go through, but very early days so far of gathering the data. And that is me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was um, really interesting. And I'm sure we, we will all have some suggestions in our panel discussion a bit later of ways in which perhaps the data that is being collected could be analysed, can be checked up on, um, can be sorted into a way that will give meaning to, to these clearly very um, demanding um, procedures that, that the dancers have to go through. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Lucy, who is... Um, um, away from us, Lucy Onifuro, who is um, going to talk to us about the selection process for bobsleigh. So welcome, Lucy. It's lovely to see you again. Hi, Bev. Nice to see you too. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you that may be in North America or in the Caribbean, as I am today. Um, my name is Lucy Onifuro, as Bev mentioned. I am now a litigation attorney at um, Dorsey and Whitney Law Firm in New York. Um, but previously, I was a 100 meter sprinter and I was a break woman for Great Britain's bobsleigh team. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my transition from being a 100 meter sprinter to bobsleigh um, and um, the general selection process and the various initial physical indicators that sort of gives the performance directors um, an insight into the fact that you may be good at bobsleigh. And then I'll discuss the combination of tests used um, to assess an athlete's performance and the likelihood of success in bobsleigh. Um, so first, I'll give you a bit of a background on my own personal story um, and how I came to be a 100 meter sprinter and then transition into bobsleigh. So I had, all, I had always been quite fast as a child and um, competed in sports and sort of didn't take it that seriously. But um, during university, I got more involved in sprinting and international competition and ended up competing in the 100 metres and doing pretty well at the collegiate level. Um, from there, I sort of realised that, you know, I had um, an aptitude, I had, I, was, I had an ability to, to, to sprint fast and to, to perform well. Um, and I really wanted to take that to another level. Um, I was doing a law degree at the University of Birmingham at the time. Um, and um, one of my mentors basically advised me to, to pursue my sporting career because, you know, there's a finite period in time um, in which you're able to be the best possible athlete you can be. Um, but you can be a lawyer at any age. Um, so I went ahead and did that and trained as a sprinter, trained with um, Linford Christie, who I'm sure most of you probably know. Um, as a 100 meter sprinter. Um, I did the Olympic trials in 2012. Um, unfortunately, had a, a torn hamstring at the time, um, but still competed. And I was spotted um, by the Great Britain bobsleigh performance director um, who had seen me running at the Olympic trials. And he said that I'm the type of sprinter that would probably do very well in bobsleigh because I'm a power sprinter. And I'll dissect that. Um, a little later um, in this, this presentation. Um, so he said he thinks that I'd do quite well and he'd love me to come and do the combine test for bobsleigh. Now, I didn't actually know much about the sport of bobsleigh at the time. Um, unlike most people my age, I had not seen cool running. So I had nothing, I had no reference points. I hadn't seen it. I didn't know what it was. Um, anyway, so I went ahead and did the combine test um, where they're based at Bath University. And uh, again, later on in this presentation, I will dissect um, the components of the combine test and the way in which they assess your ability to be able to perform in obviously. So I went ahead and did the combine test as a series of um, exercises uh, that are explosive and powerful. And basically, they add the points together and figure out where you would be ranked. And I was ranked number one straight away and was able to go out and join the, um, the world championship team 
before I had had the opportunity to even go on ice. Um, going on ice is obviously very important. Um, there's a transitional element from when you go on ice, and I'll again dive into that when I go through the various um, tests that they they use to identify whether or not you'd be good at bobsled. So I did that, had a great time competing as a bobsled athlete, and I retired in 2015. So first, um, let me go back to the what the performance director said to me, which was that I was a power sprinter and he thinks that I'd be good at bobsled. Obviously, all sprinters are fast. That's what all sprinters have in common. But we all have different sort of physical compositions that, you know, help us to be fast. Some people are light and glide across the track quite quickly because they're light. Some people are more powerful. They're explosive. They, you know, burst through the track. And, um, you know, these different attributes kind of lend themselves to different sports. Um, so power sprinters tend to be quite good at bobsled. Um, so to go into the combine test, what they look for is how fast you can sprint over 60 meters, um, your ability to be able to jump, how far you can jump in five leaps. So they measure that. Um, they, and they measure that specifically because you have to jump into a bobsled. Um, you cannot hold onto a bobsled and get in. Um, you have to sort of let go of it and simultaneously jump into the sled. So they measure how, how far you can jump in five jumps. Um, and then they sort of have this makeshift bobsled, which they stack a variety of weights on, and you push it over 45 meters. The reason they do this is because, as I said, you have to jump into the sled. The sled itself is very heavy. Um, the maximum weight for a sled, at least when I was competing, was um, at least in 2015, was 340 kilos. I know that they've been reducing it slightly to try to make it um, a bit fairer for other nations, just naturally, just genetically, people, different nations have a disposition for different physical abilities um, or, or weights. Um, so to make it sort of evenly uh, distributed across nations, they try to kind of reduce the minimum weight for um, a bobsled. But yeah, so the maximum weight was 340 kilos, and that is the sled and the two athletes, so that's the driver and the brake woman for women's bobsled, it's just two people. Um, and so they they want to make sure that you're strong enough to push that 340 kilos as a brake woman, um, because you're basically essentially pushing the sled and you're pushing the driver. So the driver helps you to get the initial start. But once they take a few steps, they jump in and then the bobsled brake person, brake woman for me, would be pushing the sled for another sort of 15, 20 meters um, with the driver in it. Um, so they measure your ability to be able to push a certain amount of weight at speed. Um, and then the jump, that's very, very important. They measure how far you can jump in five leaps simply because if you do not, um, if you cannot jump very well, you will not make it into the sled. And if you don't make it into the sled, it's an automatic disqualification. Um, you also, they also don't want you to hold onto the sled and jump in because then you will kill all the speed that you've generated in that initial push, which is what helps you to go down the track. And as I mentioned, there's a maximum weight of 340 kilos and you want to try to be the, the maximum weight. This is because obviously you're going down a bobsled track. And when you go down a track, the heavier you are, the quicker you're going to go down the track. You're going to pick up more speed and you'll get to the bottom a lot quicker. Um, so generally speaking, if the athletes aren't heavier, then what they would do is they put sort of bars of metal inside the bobsled to make the sled heavier so that you're the same combined weight um, as the other nations that are competitive. Um, and so initially when I joined uh, the Great Britain bobsleigh team, although I was a heavier track sprinter, I was a light bobsledder. Um, and so we had to put on, I had to put on some weight and I also had to add metal uh, bars into the sled so that we were the same weight as say, for example, Team USA, Team Canada, who generally had bigger and heavier athletes. Um, and so you can imagine bigger, heavier athletes pushing a significantly lighter sled because they're carrying the body weight. Um, you're already at a disadvantage. So the idea is that, yes, you may be fast. Yes, you may be strong. But to level the playing field, you need to have the, the body mass and the, and the weight that would allow you to have a lighter sled um, so that you have that combination of you being strong, powerful and then pushing a lighter sled. 
Um, so yes, that's what we had to do, and um, that's how we remained competitive. So the combine test itself um, was a way in which they would sort of figure out whether or not you had that natural uh, ability to be able to um, to be able to do well at the sport. But then they had to take you out onto ice to make sure that you could put all of those skills together and actually execute it um, in a competitive environment. Um, also usually in the mountains, freezing cold, as you can imagine, um, high altitude. And so there were a number of other factors that were at play there that could mean that it wasn't automatic that you would be great at the combine test and then you'd be great at um, bobsleigh, the actual sport. But it was most likely that if you were able to run fast, push a heavy sled over a short distance quite quickly and jump really far, that those things together would be the combination of things that would help you to be able to do well in bobsleigh. Um, and obviously, like I said, to be competitive against those that are the best in the world. Now, you do have nations, for example, that have much lighter athletes, just naturally, that's just their genetic composition. And so um, they're sort of faced with, yes, they are being, they're, they're quite quick sprinters. Um, they might be great at jumping, but because they're pretty light, um, they are pushing a significantly heavier sled to um, Team USA, Team Canada, Team Germany, those are you know some of the, the best um, bobsleigh teams in the in the world. Um, so if you're if you're you know you're still fast and you're still strong, but you're pushing a significantly heavier sled, you just can't you can't be competitive. Um, so as I mentioned, um, it, the rules have actually recently changed, and um, the um, the uh, International Bobsled Federation have now tried to reduce the weight of um, the bobsleigh and the, the weight of athletes so that other nations can have a fair chance at competing. Um, but as mentioned, this is not necessarily ideal because, yes, you might be allowed to compete, but will you be competitive enough to, to win a medal? Um, maybe not, because ultimately you want to be at the maximum weight. You don't want to be at the minimum weight. Because even if you're a skillful, even if you have a very skillful driver, because I'm, I'm sure some people don't know this, but there's actually what they call D-rings in a bobsleigh, um, which a driver would use to steer the sled. Um, and there are various methods of getting from the top to the bottom. It's, uh, they kind of call it Formula One on ice. Um, you, it's basically like you could, you could try and drive from the top to the bottom using the safe lines. But the safe lines, which is the lines that will lead, less likely to lead to a crash, are often the slow lines. In fact, they're all, almost always the slow lines. So what you want to use are the fast lines. They're slightly more dangerous, but they, they're going to get you from the top to the bottom the quickest. And that's generally what you want to do if you want to be competitive. And then, as, as mentioned, you want to be um, as heavy as possible so you can go from the top to the bottom as quickly as possible. Um, right, I think, I think I may have covered most of my points. I'm just going to quickly double check. I haven't missed anything um yeah i think i've covered most of my points um and um i'm you know open to questions i know that this has probably been quite a short and quick snapshot of the statistical elements of what is required um in bobsleigh and the things in which um the performance directors and the federations measure to a check whether or not somebody would be likely to be a good sprinter a good bobsledder uh, and make that transition and B, whether or not they have the, um, the things that they need to be competitive in the sport, i.e., are you heavy enough to push a heavy sled? Are you fast enough to get from point A to point B quickly and, um, and be able to reduce the weight in your sled by having that as your body mass as opposed to weight in the sled? And whether or not you can be competitive against other nations in the world? Um, so yeah, any questions, please feel free to save those for the end and um, I will give the floor back to Bev. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucy, for that whistle-stop tour of how to become a British national bobsleigh um, athlete. Um, for our final talk, we have Naomi Datsun from the University of Chichester who's going to talk to, to you about some of her um, work with women football um, players. <laughs> I will get the word right. With women, women football players. Um, 
Do keep thinking about questions for any of our speakers. They, they are all taking a very, very different approach to what essentially is the same problem. Um, it's how do um, numbers, how do statistical analyses help us to um, improve the performance of female athletes? Thank you, Naomi. Thanks, Bev, and hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this presentation today. So as Bev said, I'm going to focus on some of the statistics uh, used within soccer. Uh, I'll probably call it football sometimes. I'll use those two terms interchangeably, um, particularly looking at the women's game. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk through today, um, I'll start just by giving you a brief background and introduction to myself. It won't take long. Uh, then I'll look at some of the statistics we commonly use um, in soccer. I'm going to focus on women's soccer research, um, so I'm going to go through a couple of kind of key papers in this area and then just finish up with some of the directions for future research. So, introduction to myself, a disclaimer here, I'm not a statistician, uh, which seems a little bit ironic uh, to be talking to you today at this conference. Um, but what I am is an applied uh, practitioner and also a researcher. So I hope uh, you'll find some of the topics that I talk about interesting um, to see how we can kind of try and combine the practical approach to perhaps some of your more statistical minds and questions that you might have. So as I said, um, I'm an applied practitioner, practitioner primarily. Um, so I spent over 10 years working um, at high levels of the game so I started as a sports scientist and then finished up being head of sports science at the FA, so looking after all of the England women's teams. Um, so a couple of happy memories up there on the screen um, of good times celebrating uh, the team successes um, in their competitions. I left the FA in 2016, uh, but I still continue to work in the women's game. Um, so I offer some consultancy services and currently I'm working with Celtic um, and also with the Northern Irish Football Association. So I said in 2016, that was kind of when I made my transition from being a full-time practitioner uh, to being a full-time academic. So the day job now is uh, lecturing to undergraduate and postgraduate students, occasionally inspiring them, but I'm not sure about that, um, really in all kind of areas of sports science disciplines. I'm really fortunate at Chichester because we're one of only nine FA women's high-performance football centres. So that means it's a really good opportunity for me to carry on working in the women's game and researching in that area as well. So kind of the two areas have come together quite nicely for me. So get on to the real topic for today. So some of the statistics used um, within soccer. Um, and it's really been kind of a hot topic, um, thinking about statistics used within soccer for a number of years, and actually we can go back kind of over 50 years, and I'm going to show you a couple of seminal research papers, uh, which kind of really set the ball rolling um, in this particular area. So first of all, 1968, uh, a paper by uh, Reap and Benjamin, um, and they published it in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. And this paper really looked at some of the technical and tactical characteristics of the game. So in their paper, they looked at um, how many passing possessions were needed uh, before teams would have a shot on goal, um, how many shots were needed before teams would score a goal, and some of the kind of statistics in that area. A few years later, uh, Riley and Thomas, uh, they actually started to look at some of the physical demands of match play. So they looked at how far players might run in a game, and they looked to see if there were differences between different playing positions, so defenders versus midfielders. So these two uh, sort of studies were really inspirational in kind of kick-starting this field. I think one thing that's really important to remember is these studies, they collected their data manually using hand notation, so really long, arduous processes, and I think that's something we probably forget, myself included. We're so fortunate these days that we've just got you know, so much data available at our fingertips, so it's always worth remembering where we've come from. And it's continued to be a real topic of interest, um, sort of numbers and statistics within soccer. You know, there's a number of books which are published and continue to be published. And, you know, these are of interest to many different audiences, uh, coaches, practitioners, fans. 
And we can't forget how social media has had an impact as well. So things like Twitter have provided platforms for either individuals or organisations to kind of get their findings and get their infographics and their data out there um, in terms of how individuals or in terms of how teams are performing. So I mentioned that I'm going to focus more on kind of the women's side of the game as opposed to the men's side. I took this photo myself, I quite like it, uh, when I was at the World Cup, uh, the Women's World Cup in 2019 in France. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the women's game, it really is increasing um, in almost every area. And you may have witnessed that. It was the uh, start of the season this weekend, and there was coverage everywhere, which is unusual and, you know, pleasing at the same time. So the game is growing, uh, participation figures are increasing, uh, FIFA hope by 2026 there'll be 60 million players worldwide, um, and FIFA are actually, you know, they're supporting the game at every level. They're uh, funding large aspects of the game, and they've actually doubled their um, funding to 1 billion US dollars over the next four years. In terms of scientific publications as well, uh, there's been a huge sort of increase in interest in this area. And this nice paper published earlier this year actually plotted the number of articles that were published year on year in women's football. So you can see for many years it was one, maybe two or three articles published each year. Uh, but then around about 2000 started to increase and then more recently an even sharper increase. So the game is growing, uh, people are interested in it, people are playing in it. So, I guess going back to my role as a practitioner in terms of sort of helping players, uh, this is a model that we would use frequently to kind of assess our players. So, this is the FA four corner model, um, and it's used in terms of player development. So, we would often look to see how are players doing in each of these areas, because these were deemed the areas that the players would need to kind of be successful in. So we would track individual players. Uh, we'd often have benchmarks as well as to where we thought players needed to be on certain areas within these four domains. Um, I'd love to be able to talk to you about all of them today. Uh, unfortunately, there's not time. So I'm going to focus pr predominantly on the physical aspect. Um, and then at the end, we'll just have a little look at some of the technical um, characteristics as well. So to start with, on the physical side, um, there's a huge amount of data that we're interested in as practitioners from uh, the physical corner of the four corner model. So I've tried to break it down into kind of three main areas um, to help sort of make sense of it, if you like. So the first one is match statistics. And I don't know if you notice when you perhaps see players play, uh, often they'll have a little bump on the back of between their shoulder blades. And that often is where their GPS unit um, is housed. Um, that gives us lots and lots of information, um, information that you can see up there. So how far players have run, how much distance they've covered in high speed running or sprinting thresholds. Um, so yeah, a huge amount of data. Um, lots of practitioners use this information in lots of different ways. Um, I've seen some interesting things. I think just yesterday I was looking on Twitter and someone had a GPS leaderboard. So it was, you know, the player at the top had covered the most distance. I have a few reservations about whether that's the best way to sometimes present the data, because uh, ultimately the players are playing a game and the physical demands are a result of what's happening actually in the game. So personally, I like to look at the match statistics as that's just what the players did in the game and then use that information to then inform what we prescribe the players to do for the next few days in terms of what their training looks like and maybe what their recovery looks like. So if they've had a harder game than normal, perhaps we'd increase the recovery and reduce the training. Um, but lots of different practitioners have different approaches, which is all part of the fun, I think. Um, in terms of training statistics, um, so again, we can get lots of information similar to we get in the game. Players will wear their GPS units, so we get an idea of the external training load. But we can also get an idea of the internal training load. So often players will wear heart rate belts, um, and that allows us to see what was the physiological response uh, for that individual player based on the training that they'd done. We're also really interested often in player recovery, so how well have the players recovered following a high-intensity training bout or a number of matches. And then just finally in this area, 
Um, we also get a number of data points around players' physical capabilities. So we often do fitness testing, which is not everyone's favourite time of year, but we'll test the players for speed, strength, power, and we'll really try to get an understanding of what do they look like as an individual player. So what are their strengths and weaknesses? When we know what their strengths and weaknesses are, we can then formulate an individual training programme for that player. So as you can see, that's probably just scratching the surface, but a huge array of physical statistics we can get on players. But for me, the trick is about which ones do we collect and then what do we do with the information we've collected. So again, I can't go through all of them, but I'm just going to focus on one specific area for you, and that's going to be on talent identification. So focusing on talent ID, uh, mainly it's a huge interest to me, but also, as I said at the start, women's football or women's soccer is growing, um, and it's becoming more and more sort of business-like. Um, so therefore, these players are assets, if you like. So if we can identify and develop the best players, they'll become better in our club. Our club may win more games, may win more tournaments, get more money, or we develop those assets, those players, and we sell those players, um, transfer them and get money in. Uh, it sounds a bit cutthroat, but it's sport, that's what happens, and that's you know, the way women's football is going as well. So yeah, just gonna focus on this talent ID area and just talk you through a study um, that we did in this area. So the study came on the back of my PhD. I finished my PhD a few years ago, um, and really that was quite a descriptive piece of work, uh, mainly because there wasn't a huge amount of information out there about women's football at the time. So I looked at sort of the demands of match play and the physical characteristics of players. But after I'd finished, I thought we had some really interesting data that I wanted to kind of explore a little bit more. So on the right-hand side here, we've got the kind of women's performance pyramid. So at the top, the England women's senior team, that's kind of the highest level. At the bottom, we've got kind of the grassroots level. And what I was interested in was, is there a way that we can see what are the characteristics of players that make them progress up the pyramid? So we had some data where this green line is. We had information about those players there. I wanted to see how do we know which ones are going to progress up to that next level, the blue level. Um, so that was kind of the, the foundation of the study. So to just talk you through, I guess, a little bit on the rationale. Um, at the time, obviously, I was working with England um, and with them being a sort of a national governing body and an international team, they don't have the luxury to buy players. Um, so therefore, talent ID and talent development, I think, is probably even more important. You know, a Chelsea or an Arsenal can go and buy a player that they want. At England, it's about identifying those players and then um, developing them as best as you can. Um, Talent ID and development is tricky, it's complicated. I think that's why people kind of stay away from it sometimes. Um, it takes a long time as well because there's two ways to do it. You can either prospectively track players and see where they end up, or you can retrospectively track players and see, you, can, you know where they ended and you kind of go back to see where they started from. So it's a little bit of a tricky, tricky one. Um, you know, fortunate in terms of women's football, women's soccer, there isn't a huge amount of research out there. So pretty much if you want to do a study, you've got a gap in the research because no one's really done it before. Um, so there was definitely an opportunity for us to extend what we already knew in this area. So in terms of how we went about doing the study, um, it, we used the retrospective analysis approach. So as I mentioned in my PhD, we had this kind of fitness testing data for these players that had potential what we wanted to find out is what actually happened to those players. So did they actually go on to represent England at those higher levels? So we had a big sample, uh, nearly 300 players. And at the time the players were tested, uh, they were aged between sort of 12 and 15. But our analysis took place kind of five years after this point. In terms of the testing and the information that we had, Players did, uh, we had measures of their anthropometric status, so that is things such as their height, their body mass, uh, their sum of skin folds, which is an indication of their body composition. Then we had some performance testing, so CMG is counter movement jump, how high can a player jump. We've got 10 and 30 meters sprinting, so how quick are they? and then the yo-yo intermittent recovery test, and that is a marker of endurance. It's a little bit like a beep test for football. 
Um, all players were fully familiarised with the protocols and we also did reliability testing as well. So what did we find? Um, well, of our nearly 300 players, uh, 50 of them were successful and moved up into that next category, so they went on to represent England. And that's a similar kind of uh, proportion as has previously been seen in male soccer and also in Olympic sports. Just calculate on a uh, simple percentage, that was meant 22% of the players were selected up to that next level. So just to remind you, our sort of testing was in the green lines, so the FA Girls National Performance Camp, and we wanted to see if we could work out what are the physical characteristics of the players that kind of get selected to that next level. So can we try and predict which players would actually have made that transition? So to show you some of the data, um, this is for the anthrop anthropometric uh, measures, so body mass, height, and some of eight skin folds. So when we look at that data, I think the first thing which kind of stands out, for me anyway, is the huge range of you know, values that we've got. And that just really indicates the players that were coming into that system uh, you know, were all different shapes, sizes. Um, you know, at that age period between 12 and 15, you often get quite sort of different players uh, that are all, all at different levels of maturity and development. Then what we did is we took the performance testing um, data that we had. So here we've got an example of the 10 meter sprinting. Um, and what we've got on the, hopefully you can see the colors okay, but on the left hand side, the red dots, they all relate to players that weren't successful. So they were the players that didn't go on to represent England at the next level. The shape on the right-hand side, where we've got less dots, they're blue, hopefully you can see them, they're the players that were successful, so went on to represent England at that next um, age group. And then underneath, we've got our means and standard deviations for the group. So if we look at this example for 10-metre sprinting, we can see that on average, our players that were selected for the next age group were a little bit quicker than the players that weren't selected. We see a really similar pattern with 30 meter sprinting. Um, so we've got slightly quicker players that were selected um, to that next category than the players that weren't. Counter movement jump, again, similar pattern. Obviously it's flipped this time because we want the players to jump higher. So we're looking for a higher value. Um, so a slightly higher jump performance in the selected players compared to the non-selected players. And then, again, similar for yo-yo, but this time a little bit more of a gap. Um, so a slightly higher uh, difference between, or a greater difference between the selected players and the non-selected players. So I mentioned that I'm not a statistician. Luckily, I know a man who is. Um, so this is uh, Lorenzo Lolly. He's based in Qatar, and he helped with sort of the analysis for this paper. Um, and what we really wanted to know, as I mentioned, was were any of these performance tests able to help us predict which players would go on to represent England at that next level? Um, and if we look here, we can see that it's only really the yo-yo test which is giving us some kind of um, predictive ability. So in terms of sort of like graphing and tabulating that, as you can see, um, players who had a higher yo-yo intermittent recovery test had then a higher predicted probability of selection at the next level. And that pretty much was our main finding. Okay, so players with a higher, higher yo-yo score more likely to go on to represent England at competitive squads, uh, regardless of playing position. So that kind of information is useful for us when we've got players coming into this talent pool, perhaps helping us try to understand which players we think might go on to be successful at the next level, perhaps then helping us try to allocate resources to the appropriate players, because we obviously we can't, you know, you can't give everything to every player all of the time. Um, so if you want to read a little bit more about it, that's the paper um, that I've spoken about, and obviously the list of authors as well. No study is without, obviously, its limitations. Um, because this was a retrospective study, uh, we kind of just used the data that we had. Uh, that's all we had. Um, and I spoke about the four-corner model. 
this only focused on the physical characteristics of players. It would have been great if we could have looked at their technical ability as well, but we just didn't have that information. So it was inherently a little bit limited because we were only focused on that one aspect of player development. Talent ID is a messy process. Players go up and down in terms of their performance levels, and we could only take data from one time point. So again, you know, something to expand on um, for future studies. And the, co the cultural differences is really important. Um, this was a study with English players and whether they went on to represent England. England will play a certain way. Therefore, the physical characteristics that England might look for might be different to perhaps a Spain or a Holland or a France. They might look for something different based on their own style of play. So that's kind of a whistle-stop tour of some of the physical aspects. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on some of the technical characteristics of match play as well. And when I'm talking about technical characteristics, I'm meaning things like this. So the number of shots a player might have, the number of passes, crosses, either for individual players or for teams. Um, I'm just going to introduce you to a really nice study that was done last year. Uh, not by me. Uh, this one was done by De Jong and colleagues. And what they did was they took a huge amount of variables, so technical variables, and they tried to see if they could work out which of those variables were most associated with success in female soccer. So their approach, uh, they had a lot of data, which is great. They had nearly 700 games, 450 variables, and they used kind of three analysis approaches to try to answer this question. So this uh, diagram was taken directly um, from the paper, um, and you can see the kind of three approaches that they used. So the first one was their data-driven approach, and that's where they used all the variables that they could access. They then used a rational approach, and that was trying to use variables that the coaches deemed to be important, so try to kind of narrow that down a little bit. And then their third approach was this literature-driven approach, and that was using variables that had previously been used in other research, mainly in male soccer. So there were their three different approaches, and they had two phases um, of analysis. The first one was where they used all of the variables, and then the second phase was where they took out any variables which related to uh, goals being scored um, to try and understand that in a little bit more detail. So... Their kind of main findings um, in terms of their variables which contributed to success in the women's game were these three. They were their top three. So it's important to score the first goal. It's important to have more intentional assists relative to the opponent. And it's important to have more shots saved by the goalkeeper relative to the opponent. So where this is useful is if you're a coach uh, or working in the women's game, these are kind of key variables that you may want to focus on, and therefore you may want to try and adapt your strategy to try and make sure that you, you, know, you do well in these areas. Obviously, some of them are harder than others. You know, scoring the first goal, you can't necessarily control that. Uh, you know, if the other team score first, it may then be about how you uh, respond to them scoring the first goal. But still, it's useful to have an awareness that these are the three things which seem to contribute the most um, to success in the women's game. Interestingly, they found in this study that when they used the relative variables, so for example, the one in the middle, more intentional assists relative to the opponent, they found that to be a stronger predictor of success when they were considering relative to the opponent as opposed to just how many assists our own team had had. And that's something a little bit novel in both men's and women's um, soccer research. When they did the second phase of analysis, so they took out kind of the score-related variables, they found that it was um, determinants such as uh, the number of duels that players had had and the number of headed duels, tackles and interceptions. And those kind of um, variables all kind of relate to almost like an aggressive style of play. So again, that was something that was taken forward in terms of the research about perhaps maybe a, an aggressive strategy within women's soccer might actually prove to be a successful approach. So again, a few kind of pick-up points from their paper, things they suggested as well. Um, like our study, this was kind of focusing on one area. So they were looking at, you know, the technical variables which contribute to success as looked at physical. What we really need is to someone to try and get a handle of like the whole picture, because uh, otherwise, you know, we're working in individual silos. So we need to try and kind of bring that together. 
they also suggested it would be useful to have um, the same approach used for male and female um, analysis, and that hasn't been done. And that would be useful to see if actually, do we need the same strategy for male soccer, or do we need a different strategy? Um, so how they kind of uh, align together. And then finally, the same limitation as we had in ours, when you're just looking at a sample from a particular area, so whether it's Europe or whether it's England, you'll then, you can't, you know, you can't generalize too far um, with your findings. It's just about the particular data um, that you have. So a whistle-stop tour again um, of sort of soccer, stats used within soccer, um, and particularly a focus on women's research. So... Thank you for listening, and I think we'll take questions together as a panel, I believe. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Sarah, Naomi, can I invite you to come and sit up here? Lucy, we can see you again, so hello. Um, and we will take questions from the floor as people would like to ask them. It would be useful if you could make your way to one of the microphones to speak, I think. Is that right? Um, in order to, that, that everybody can hear you. Lucy, if you can't hear, can you just sort of indicate so that I can, um, if there's a question for you, that I can reiterate it for you? Sure, no problem. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Eleanor Ralphs. Uh, thank you for the talks. Um, I just have a question for Sarah. Was it Sarah? Um, where did the research idea come from? Was this a call from dancers that they wanted, they felt like they were like, exerting themselves too much and they needed recognition, or was it the managers were seeing high turnover? Or... Really interesting question. Um, I actually, I think it, it mainly actually came from, from people like me, I guess, and I, people uh, mainly from sports science who were looking at you know, had some kind of link to dance or, you know, maybe knew someone who was working in dance and, and looked at the, the practice and, and sort of went in there. So we, we are having a little... It, we're coming out the other side of it now where we are... It is being embraced now by the company management and by the dancers themselves, but it, it didn't really come from within. Um, so that's, that's been a kind of battling against tradition and, and how things are done um, as well from the kind of dance science support side in um but yeah that's a really interesting really interesting question and it, it does make the research a bit more challenging sometimes i mean luckily with the, the work i'm doing at the minute with river dance they are so open to it and they you know the, the company management are asking us for feedback on on the practices that they're doing um the dancers are really engaged with it but that's not always the case and then um, I, I can't remember what it's called but i know with choreography hmm. isn't there um, like the way it's written, do you ever have you ever thought about exploring? I don't know if there's a way you can map choreography, and then with the intensity, is that how you work out the like intensity load? Um, I see what you mean. Yeah, when they sort of they use notation, yeah, to to uh, write down the choreography. I ha we haven't looked at that. No, no. Typically, um, we use a lot of kind of video analysis, similar sort of methods as as you'd use in in football. Um, to look at what they're doing and, and a lot of it is also based on individual perception of um, demand so another sort of strand of the work that we're trying to do at the minute is do sort of one off where we can where we are measuring heart rate oxygen uptake um, during dance to then check and validate these uh, yeah the more kind of subjective ways of rating it but but you know there's, there's lots of challenges in, in research in dance um, we can't really whack a GPS unit on them um, on stage. We can just about sometimes, as we're getting away with in river dance, sneak a heart rate monitor uh, under the costume without it being detected by the audience. Um, but there are a lot of aesthetic barriers. And also, you know, performance itself is subjectively appreciated. Uh, so there's, when we're talking about improving performance, um, yeah, it does depend on, on the choreography and on the perception of the individual who's viewing it. So there are lots of lots of challenges. I don't know if that really answers your question. I'm just sort of talking about dance generally, but it is an interesting one to work in, definitely. <laughs> Hi. 
Hiya, um, my name is Melanie Lewis. I work for the Office for National Statistics. Um, I don't know whether this is maybe an impossible question for all, all three of um, three of you. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, but I wonder if you if you had to put a value um, on statistics to kind of sporting performance, what you might say it is. You know, now that you have access to some of this fantastic data that we haven't previously had. Um, what that kind of gain is compared to the expertise of, of coaches um, and managers, you know, who can look at a, a player or a dancer and kind of tell them what to do to improve. What, what do you think that kind of increase might be if you were to try and put a figure on it? <laughs> um, good question. I think it's probably near on impossible to put an actual uh, figure on it. I guess what I'd say is I think it has, you know, enormous possibilities. Um, and as I guess I alluded to a little bit in my talk, it's about trying to identify what are the right stats and numbers to use and how best to use them. I've got plenty of crazy stories with GPS. I'll share one with you now. Um, and this really comes down to kind of like the understanding, I think. Um, I see my job mainly to try to educate players and coaches, but sometimes you just keep trying uh, because I was working with a coach and um, he basically decided for the week the players would be split into... I think it was like three teams and whichever team had the highest GPS values at the end of the week, I don't know, won a prize or didn't have to do a forfeit or something. So prior to the warm up, I literally saw players throwing their GPS units to each other to try and to get more meters on their unit to be able to, you know, try to win the game for, you know, the tournament for the week. Um, and st when things like that happen, you just want to go and, you know, lock yourself in a room because it's just, you know, you're trying to educate and, you know, clearly something's breaking down. Um, and I guess that's the point for me with the physical demand stuff in terms of the GPS. It's about what happens in the training session or the game. It's not about having the highest values because um, sp I've spoken to players before and they're like, oh, that player's really annoying because, yeah, they get a really high GPS, but they're always running around and they're in my space in the game. So, you know, it's, it's about trying to sort of give context and meaning to you know to the information so I think huge potential but it's also about trying to manage that expectation and trying to educate which is a continual process because you know doing the GPS workshop at the start of the season clearly isn't enough it's kind of a continual process with players and with coaching staff as well so a story but I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> I, I like to add that, um, at least from my perspective as an athlete, um, you know, both the sports that I've competed in, you're talking about hundreds of a second, the difference between winning and losing, right? So it's exceptionally important to be able to analyze statistics and data that can help you to make those minor tweaks that will help you to improve by that hundredth of a second. Um, so it's definitely helped, and, and both my sports have. Um, different factors that have an impact on the eventual outcome. So you kind of need to look at all of those things. Um, as a personal example for me, when I transitioned from the 100 meters to bobsleigh, I actually became faster as a sprinter. I sprinted even faster being heavier and doing bobsleigh than I did when I was a 100 meter sprinter. And it was probably indirectly because I was recovering a lot more, but then I was also incorporating more resistance training because I'm obviously pushing a sled. So once that sled is no longer there, I'm able to run a lot faster. So these kind of things do need to be analyzed. And you know, when you start looking at the numbers, you can make those tiny little tweaks that can make all the difference. Thank you. Can I just add one? Oh, yes. Just, sorry, just sorry. one tiny little point on that. It might be you know, extra info. Um, I always try and whenever I'm working, whether I'm talking to choreographers or company management or the dancers, I always try and emphasize that what we're doing is supporting, not replacing. So, you know, you're saying about the coaches, you know, the teachers, the choreographers, they're the experts and they're the ones that are really going to make, you know, I was talking here, the big differences, but that we can maybe help the smaller differences and also, you know, not necessarily in the case of dance, directly, you know, change the performance necessarily on stage, but their health and well-being, their injury resistance, their ability to... So I always explain it as, as supportive um, rather than, yeah, trying to prove the exact... If, I, if you do this, it's going to make this change. And I was wondering, and this is for all three of you, if you've 
been able to compare the data on women's sport, and I know that um, you know in dance you did have the data on the male dancers and the female dancers, but for bobsleigh as well. So the factors that you are finding are leading to wins, or the factors that you're finding are leading to you know the going professional, or you know what's going to predict you know a good you know which sprinters are going to make good bobsleigh. Have you been able to see if that's actually quite specific to women, and in fact the the predictive factors and the tweaking factors are different for men, or have you had a chance to make those comparisons to see if it really does need to be sort of sex specific and sport specific? Um, yeah, not in our particular research, and I think that's what happens with a lot of research. It's focused on, you know, I'll do a study on women and someone else will do a study on men. Um, so there are some kind of uh, when you can compare between some different studies, but there's not really been done like together, so obviously using like the same methods and the same approaches. Um, so yeah, some, um, and I guess it's about knowing when it's important to compare and when it's important to have differences as well. So for example, looking at the, you know, the technical determinants of success, that's quite useful in terms of being able to devise a strategy which may be different for the women's game versus the men's game. Um, but then perhaps looking at like the GPS metrics, it may not be relevant to compare men and women because they don't play together and you know the demands are different. Um, so yeah, I think it it hasn't really been done with the same methodology necessarily. It's more kind of different um, different approaches for different studies. Lucy, have you anything to add? Yeah, sure. So from bo the bobsled perspective, the the combine test is exactly the same for men and women. Um, just from my own observation and not that I've done any necess necessary analysis. Um, but you do have um, a lot of the men that are heavy enough and some that are trying to actually cut a little bit of weight to, to fit into the sled. Whereas for the Great Britain team, at least, the women generally are trying to add weight on, like physically, um, so that they don't have to push a heavy sled. Um, so I've noticed that. But, but again, every, every athlete is so different. Um, and even amongst the men, there are some men that are lighter um, and there are some men that are heavier and they kind of play different roles. I think it's, it's easier for, uh, for the men because they actually do a four-person bobsleigh as well. And so the various different body types suit different positions in the sled. Um, so they've got more options to kind of move around and decide um, what suits their body composition best. Thank you, Lucy. Sarah? Um, I mean, it's a similar answer to, to Mary, really. I mean, obviously, we haven't collected nearly, nearly as much data um, in dance yet as been collected in football. Um, but one thing we have to be mindful of in dance is that everyone has different roles. So if you think about traditional, so in um, similar to different positions in football, I guess, uh, in, a, in traditional ballet, you know, the males have much more upper body demand because they're lifting the women. Um, the women have next to no upper body demand uh, in ballet, but they do in other dance styles. Um, so, yeah, we haven't, we haven't sort of done comparisons yet, but we are trying to capture data on everyone, not necessarily to compare, but to look. And I'm, in particular, quite keen at making sure that we are looking at the nuances of those different roles rather than just lumping it all together as dance. You know, we'd never do research just on sport it would be research on football or a particular sport so um yeah we're trying to to drill down into all the different nuances within dance generally we have a question raised online for naomi if you could read it please yeah that's start. fine i'll thank read you. the question and then give my answer thank you um did your approach for talent spotting find any hidden gems those who had made it to the top but lacked those typical attributes earlier in their pathway um, so in essence, yes. Um, as you saw from kind of the um, the modelling, you know, yo-yo, yes, the yo-yo test gave us kind of the best predictor, but it's it wasn't great, um, you know. And I think that's the that's the issue with kind of football performance in general. Um, it's not about you know as we might have in sprinting or bobsleigh about. Ten, you know, seconds and times and distances. It's it's a really complicated sport where obviously we've got a high technical component, we've got a tactical component as well. Um, so yeah, we we constantly find players which almost buck the trend. You know, we don't have a model of this is the player that we want to get and they need to score this on all of these different tests across all of these different um, you know performance measures. Um, so yeah, we did have a number of players like how is that player represented? the senior women's team where actually, 
you know, their scores perhaps on the speed test or the yo-yo test might not be anywhere near um, what they should be. But ultimately, their technical ability is, you know, through the roof and they can ping a ball 60 yards and, you know, have all of these technical skills. So, yeah, it happened all the time. And I think that's part of the problem and the fun of working in sort of a team sport environment that actually, you know, there's so many different factors to consider. Thank you, Michael, for your question. Um, is, there, is there one more before the end? Thank you very much at the back. Thank you. That was all really interesting. I'm Stephen Joblin from the National Court Office. Um, just really a question, I think, for, for Naomi in terms of the data that you collect. Um, do, do you sort of are you able to use the data in a sort of a spatial way to analyse how the ball and the team kind of move together, and, and does that influence sort of tactics mm. it, prior to a game and during the game as well? How and formations and things. How does that does that all kind of come together? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, so that, um, that's an area that's definitely progressing hugely now, kind of using the XY data, um, so where all the players are, um, how that relates to formation and stuff. So it's not something I specifically um, have worked in, but it's definitely something that's quite becoming more and more common now within um, you know, football research. Um, and particularly now on the women's game, they've just... Um, had an agreement with Opta for the next season so there'll be even more sort of access to that type of information um, but yeah there's, it's definitely becoming you know more uh, more popular within within clubs um, and then also in research I think so far male uh, soccer is where kind of most of that um, tactical um, data has been uh, researched and been published on. In the women's side, there's probably one or two papers which look at that tactical component. So far, the women's game's more in the technical space in terms of number of passes, number of corners, number of shots. Um, but I think, you know, that's what I guess I alluded to with those, you know, those seminal research papers where everything was collected manually. Now we've just got so much data. But the trick is getting the right people using that data in the right way because the insights can be phenomenal. But it's finding the best way to do that and, again, making it then in a user-friendly way for the coaches and the players. So it's coming. Um, I think we're going to have to call it a day there, but if anybody has any extra questions, um, the panel will be here for a few minutes as, as we move from here um, elsewhere. Um, first of all, thank you, the audience online for listening to us and, in, and joining in the session. Um, we very much value your presence out there. Thank you to all those people in the room who have um, listened and contributed such extremely interesting questions to what we've been, what we've been presenting to you. And thank you to, to Lucy especially and to Naomi and Sarah for their contributions this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.